I'm a whisperer, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now the Whistler's strange story. Curtain call. Somehow, standing there at the bar, glass in hand, Martin Elliott found himself thinking that even his wife Julia had her good point. He looked across the room of the restaurant at her, sitting there alone. And in a strange wave of generosity, almost forgave her for the wedding he had to go through. The honeymoon he had to smile through. The two years of marriage he had to live through afterwards. Yes, it had paid off now. He was no longer Martin Elliott, a hopeful juvenile, standing hat in hand in front of the desks of assorted Broadway producers. No, not now. All afternoon, the casual remark he dropped during lunch at Brunelli's had been hustling around the Broadway hangouts like a genie. Sitting at a hundred tables, leaning on a thousand bars between noon and six. Until now, as he stood in the pleasant gloom of Raymond, he was at long last important. Ah, Martin, my boy. Hello, Cecil. Let me be the first. You're the 28th in the last half hour. (laughs) Congratulations, anyway. It's all over the stem, you know. Yes, sir. Hamilton Tevis, the great Tevis himself, is writing a starring vehicle for Broadway's most promising juvenile. Play off, Cecil. And you know what? You're here at Raymond for only one reason, my boy. You're looking for just the right character, man. And it just so happens... That I'm at liberty oh, after Martin, for heaven's sake, stop being such a rotten snob and say hello to your secret sorrow. <laughs> Says me, darling. <laughs> now, look here, Martin. Hamilton Severs always writes an old wit into his comedies, and I mean to get the party just over yeah. someone's dead <laughs> yes, body. Yes, yes. Give us a little time, <laughs> Jesse, old girl. Hamilton's only been working on it a few weeks. Oh, Hurry him up, my boy. He's your wife's brother, isn't he? Walk right into the Sanctum Sanctorum and tell him he'd better get a move on. After all, Jesse, Skip I it, have Cecil, all... Skip it. If it works out, we'll get in touch with you. Well, do you like that? The brush. I'll say. Nothing new to you, is it, Cecil? Now, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll get back to you. Well. Well, I'm sorry I left you alone so long, darling. I wasn't alone long, dear. Gordon Tucker's here. Oh? Huh? Where is he? Getting rid of his hat and coat. He has wonderful news, Martin. He reached Hamilton by phone an hour ago, and the contract's all set. Signed? Oh, better yet, it's in the mail. <laughs> Oh, Julia, darling, did I ever tell you what a wonderful brother you have? <laughs> Sometimes I think that's why you married me. <laughs> what, uh, what else did Gordon say? Oh, there might be a picture contract after the play. He's working on it. Well, maybe the guy's a real agent after all, huh? Just think, darling. Now you won't have to take that awful stock party off of you in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Get a match, Julia. Huh? Here you are. Oh. We can go away together now, Martin. All by ourselves. I wired for reservations this morning at that little hotel at Lake Louise. Now, wait a minute, honey. Wait a minute. You're not serious. Why not? Well, I can't run off just now. But, Martin, you promised. I can't help it, darling. You said you'd take two weeks together and soon you got... the play, Angel. The play. There'll be a lot of advanced publicity and I... Gordon's job, Martin. But I've got to be around now, beautiful. That's all there is to it. This is a big chance. Sure. Sure, Martin. Now that I've got it for you, isn't there some other way I can help? Or is there... Now, wait a minute, Julia. Listen to me. Julia! Oh, Lord. Will I do, Mr. Barrymore? Oh. Hello, Gordon. Sit down. Thanks. Caught the last two lines of that scene. Ah, Julia's a dead... I wish times weren't so tough. There was a day once when I only worked for honest people. Yeah? You, uh, 
Get a match, Gordon. Yeah, sure. And some free advice. Don't kick Julia around too much, Mark. She talked Ham Tevis into writing that play around you. She could talk him out of it just as easy. Ah, uh, she'd never do that. I'm not so sure. Tell me something, Martin. If Tevis had laughed at you when you made that pitch about the play, how much longer would you have stuck with you? Oh, about five minutes. Hmm, maybe I was a little hasty. You are an honest heel. Okay, Gordon, okay. Now, suppose we get down to business, huh? You didn't come here to discuss my moral shortcomings. What about the contract? I made it pretty tough. I want it that way. Does it guarantee that Tevis will write the play? Right. I'll have it in my office tomorrow morning. <laughs> You know, sometimes I think you almost earn your 10 percent. Sometimes I wonder if you earn your 90. Uh, by the way, what do you want me to do about that Boston job? That's a silly question. Tell him I'm not interested in second lead. Ah, Martin, you're a whole new girl. Well, that's life. Yesterday a bum, today Julia Tevis' husband. What? Julia! Over to the phone booth. Come on, Mike, come on. Excuse me, please, let me go with me. Come on, gentlemen. Julia, darling, what is it? What is it? What's the matter? Lisa, what happened? Well, she was on the phone, Mark. Then she just screamed and collapsed. Bartender, give us a brandy. Here. I can't believe it. I can't. What is it, Julia? I, I was calling Hamilton at his cabin. Hamilton? Why? I was so angry and upset. I didn't know what I was doing. Oh, forgive me, Mark. Julia, will you tell me what is wrong? I was going to ask Hamilton to reconsider. About you. Oh? You, uh, didn't reconsider. Oh, so much. I talked to him. A doctor. A doctor? He said, my brother's dead, Mark. Oh, he's dead. he was going to write for you. The one thing that distinguished you from a thousand other aspiring juveniles. The thing that made success a matter of months instead of years. That dead too. A heart attack, the doctor said. And that's the thing you're mourning at Hamilton Tevis' funeral. Not the man, Martin. You're in mourning for your career. To a man whom all America loves. A man who has given of his heart. Oh, Martin. Darling, I need you so much Even now. We weep I know, Julia. I know. For Hamilton's heavens to bring you Yes, Martin. You've thought a lot about Julia. He looks her age in black, doesn't he? But you're much too good an actor to give Julia the slightest hint of how you really feel, Martin. She has no way of knowing, of course, that the minute Hamilton Tevis died, you made a decision. Late that night, you tucked Julia into bed with extra tension, gently closed the door to her room, take the suitcase you'd already packed out of the closet, and just before leaving, you lay a note on the mantel of the living room. Dear Julia, when you read this, please don't phone or write. Please try to understand. I know what I'm doing is best for us both. Taking that job in Boston. Goodbye, dear. What? And two hours later, you're walking toward the door of your compartment on a night train to Boston. Right here, sir. Compartment C. Oh, that's fine, Porter. There you are. Thank you, sir. The bill's right handy if you want any. Okay, okay. Pigeonhole, Father? Well, this is compartment C, isn't it? Sort of a no, I'm afraid not. The port of your Well, so... I'll be. Oh, I'm sorry, mister. I'm supposed to be next door. Here, let me help you sew those bags. Oh, no, never mind. Why, it's no bother at all. Now, there. That ought to do it. Hardy's the name. Howard Hardy. Didn't catch yours. Uh, Martin Elliott. Yeah, pleased to meet you. You a traveling man? That's my line, you know. Plumbing, Republic Pipe and Fitting. Maybe you've heard of us? No, no. Get off in Boston. You a Bostonian? No, New York. Uh, you got a match, honey? Oh, here. Take my lighter. Hmm? Uh, you said you're a traveling man? I didn't...
didn't say. I'm an actor. An actor? Wait a minute. Ellie. Well, you're the guy. Why, I've just been reading about you in the morning paper here. Hey, too bad about your brother-in-law. Yeah, yeah, look, I've just come from his funeral, Mr. Hardy. I'm very tired. If you don't too mind. Bad. Well, anyway, I'm sure it'll be a great play. Play? What do you mean? The one Terrace finished just before he died. Well, you won't have to worry about the box office. My wife and I'll be there with the bells on. Good night, Miss Elliot. See you for breakfast in the morning, huh? Yeah, fine. Fine. It's all there, Martin. In the theatrical section of the morning paper, Mr. Hardy left on the seat of your compartment. Shortly before the Tevis funeral today, Agent Gordon Tucker revealed that a rough draft of the playwright's new comedy to star Martin Elliott had turned up in his personal facts. Production would probably be arranged this fall as scheduled through Tevis' sister, Julia Elliott. You stand there looking dumbly at the paper, feeling the wheels under your feet, and then... As the wheels of the train slow to a stop, your brain is spinning faster and faster, raging at Gordon Tucker, sure now that he kept the news of the play from you on purpose, that he'd finally decided his 10% wasn't enough. There's only one thought in your mind now, to get through to Gordon and find out what's at the bottom of it. You fumble for a coin, walk into the phone booth on the station platform, Drum your fingers impatiently while you wait for the connection. Dexter Dom. Uh, this is Martin Elliott. I want to speak to Gordon Tucker, please. I'll see if he's in. Both rules for New York City leaving on fast six. Both rules for New York on fast six. Look, Miss, hurry it up, will you? I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Tucker isn't in. But you're not thinking of Tucker, Martin. As the rage dies down, you remember Julia asleep. The note on the mantle. Julia's going to produce the play now, Martin. If you can get back in time, if you can destroy that note. You slowly hang up the phone and open the door. Then you hurry across the platform to the New York local. No time to worry about the other train and your baggage on it. Fortunately, you're barely out of the city, and if you're lucky, you can be back at your apartment in an hour. It's two in the morning when you slip into the darkness of the living room. Move silently to the mantel. Grope for that all-important note. And then as your hands fumble against the cold stone... Julia. Hello, Martin. You'd let me know when you go out. I, I thought you were asleep. Yeah, everything's all right. Martin. Yeah? Have you a mess? No, I haven't. Uh, here, take this. Thank you. I want a brain. Have you got it, Martin? Oh? Huh? Well, there's, there's nothing in it. Just said that I was going over Never to... Never mind, Martin. See? All burned up. Goodbye, Martin. What? Well, now, look here, darling. This we... morning, Martin, you left your suitcase in the hall closet all packed. Well, of course, I wanted to surprise you about going away together. The suitcase isn't there now, Martin. But I can explain. And who uh... told you about the rough draft of Hamilton's play? Isn't that what brought you back? Oh, wait a How minute. How did you find out, Martin? You mean you know about it all the time? Gordon told me. He didn't say anything. Would it have made a difference if I had? Julia! There's no use shouting at me, Martin. Julia, you know. You know, and you didn't tell me. You just let me... Run out? Yes, Martin. I was... No... Who well, are you and Gordon making a fool of me, cutting me down? Martin, stop. Trying to ruin me. No, Martin. Let me come crawling back so you can kick me like a runaway dog. Huh? Let me go, you. Let me you poor, sick, miserable old man. <laughs> All right, Julia. Sorry, I let my temper go. I shouldn't have done that. Here, let me help you up. Julia. You didn't mean to do it, did you, Mark? No. But that doesn't change anything. Julia is dead, lying at your feet where her head struck the heavy andirons by the fireplace. 
It's like a dream, isn't it, Martin? But as you stand there shivering, your brain awakens from the dream, begins to tell you that this is the way out. This is what you really wanted to do all the time. Only you didn't have the courage. The play will be yours now, won't it, Martin? Because you're Julia's heir, just as she was Hamilton's heir. So now all you have to do is get away from the apartment, prove some way that you haven't been back since this morning. And then you remember, Martin, your baggage on the train to Boston. If you could be on that train miles from New York, you couldn't possibly be linked to the murder. Just that you look like an old time at air travel, <laughs> like it might be routine stuff, you know? Oh, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do more flying for my company than any ten salesmen they've got. Oh, salesmen, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, how'd you like to sell something? Oh, I, wait, I don't know what Your to... seat. Your seat on the plane. The fare plus fifty dollars. What? Oh, well, now look, it isn't that tough to get on a well, plane anymore. Well, don't see, the flight is sold out, and it's the last one to Greenbrier until tomorrow, and... I just have to get there. I, well, I, I want to surprise my wife. Oh. Now, how about it, mister? This trip is just routine to you and with 50 bucks extra to spend here in town. Mister, you've got yourself a deal. Nobody I want to surprise that much. Oh, that's, well, that's well. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot. That'll put me in Greenbrier right on time. perfectly, isn't it? You were never missed from the train. The porter will remember calling you in the morning. You even had breakfast with the talkative Mr. Hardy. And now, back at the theater, you're just slipping into your rehearsal costume when the tragic news comes to you from New York. What? My wife murdered? Sorry to have to break it to you over the phone, Mr. Elliott. We wanted to reach you right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, Lieutenant, but... I'd be shy. Yes, I know. Uh... Tell me, Mr. Elliott, on your way up there, you got off the train at Mount Vernon. You made a phone call. I uh, checked the switchboard operator in Gordon Tucker's apartment. Yeah, yeah, of course. I made a call. And then got back on the train, right? Of course. All right. I hope you can prove that. That's all for now, Mr. Elliott. But I think you'd better get back here to New York. I I'll leave right away. I I want to be there, Lieutenant. I, I wouldn't be worth anything here. Not after this. The most difficult role is ahead of you now, isn't it, Martin? But you're confident that you can play it successfully. Confident that they won't suspect you. That no matter what questions the police lieutenant asks, you will have the answer. Back at the apartment, you square your shoulders before entering. Take a deep breath, the same as you do before an entrance to any scene. And then you step inside. Marty. Well, hello, Gordon. Uh, they got in touch with me. I came right over. Oh, he's here, Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, hello, Mr. Elliott. Lieutenant? My name is McElroy. Uh, sit down, Mr. Elliott. Uh, Marty, on some things, the lieutenant can't figure you out. I said I'd try. Oh? Just how am I supposed to express my appreciation, Gordon? I get this straight, Marty. I don't want anything. All I want to do is give you a nice white reputation. Now, look, 
Did you or did you not kill Julia? I certainly did not. I say it and I mean it. Okay. All right, Lieutenant. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's just step in the other room here, shall we? Uh, Wait a minute. Isn't that where Julia was... Do I have to go in there? It's only the living room now, Mr. Elliott. And there's somebody who ought to know you in here. Remember him, Marty? Oh, the porter on the train, sure. Yeah, I thought you'd need a good witness, Marty. I had the been a look at him for it. Oh, that's fine. Thanks, Gordon. All right, David. William. Yes, sir? This is Mr. Elliot. He was on your train last night. But what about this morning? Do you remember seeing him? Why, uh... I don't know, sir. But of course you do. You woke me up. You, you called me as we were coming into Boston. I wake so many people up, myself. I don't know. You could have been on the train. I can't lie, sir. You couldn't really prove it by me. But that's for it. Now, I'll get it. Look, you've got to remember. I, I told you I'd get dressed right away. Don't you remember? I, I came out late and I went into the dining car. I had breakfast with another passenger. I didn't see you, myself. It might be, but I didn't see you. Oh, the man's name was Hardy. Oh, Lord, you probably never locate him now. I... Hardy! What in the world? Elliot! <laughs> Surprised to see me, old man? Didn't think I'd take you up on that offer to drop in, eh? Oh, I'm ever glad that you did. You, uh, you two were on the train to Boston together? Oh, sure. <laughs> I should say so. Uh, you know, what is it? Something wrong, Elliot? Uh, no, 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 nothing is wrong. Just, just tell him we were on that train, Hardy. Tell him. All right, wait a minute. You've got identification, Mr. Hardy? Identification? Of course. Yeah. Driver's license? Uh-huh. Lottery membership? And you were on that train? Of course. At least three people on that train who knew me. And Elliot was aboard, too. We talked last night, had breakfast together this morning. You bet we were on that train. I could prove it to anybody. Uh, just proving it to the lieutenant here is enough, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> frightening moment, wasn't it, when the porter failed to recognize you? Couldn't remember for sure if you were on that night train to Boston. It almost collapsed your careful plan, made useless your desperate flight to intercept the train at Greenbrier after murdering Julia. Lieutenant McElroy was staring at you accusingly, Martin. The whole thing almost mirrored in his eyes as he thought it out. And he'd have broken you down for sure if it wasn't for the sudden appearance of a man you never thought you'd see again. Hardy, the talkative salesman. The man you met on the train last night and had breakfast with this morning. He pulled you out of it, didn't he, Martin? And now you're thankful that he talked so much. For everything he's saying makes it safe for you as you stand there in the apartment listening to him with Gordon and Lieutenant McElroy. Yes, sir, I could prove it to anybody. I got into his compartment by mistake, didn't I, Elliot? That's how we met, Lieutenant. Introduced ourselves? I see. And then he wanted the light for his cigarette. Uh, yes. Well, I uh, guess we don't have to have all the details. You've been very kind, Mr. Hardy. Yes, yes. And I hope you're all satisfied, gentlemen. That's right, Elliot. Give it to him, old man. Kill your wife. Why the very idea? We all make mistakes, Mr. Hardy. You made a big one, Lieutenant, suspecting my friend, Elliot. Like I said, I could prove it to anyone he was on the train with me. I, uh, think you have already. Well, if there's any doubt about it, I'll tell you what brought me here. They, uh, they seem to be pretty well convinced. Remember I said he wanted the light? Well, I gave him one. I lent him my cigarette lighter. Oh, no. Uh, that one right there on the mantel. He carried it off with him. Uh, by mistake, of course. Oh, wait a minute. Well, a hundred dollars, that lighter. Company gave it to me. Top salesman of the year. Wouldn't want to lose it. That's why I came after it. Well, that clear everything up. It certainly does. Doesn't it, Mark? But I... Yeah. Yeah, Lieutenant, I... Yes, it does. However, I'm afraid we can't return your lighter right away, Mr. Hardy. You see, it's a very important piece of evidence of murder. Your lighter was found right beside Mrs. Elliot's body. Let that 
whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday at this same time, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Tony Barrett and Virginia Gregg. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Robert Eisenbach and Jackson Gillis. Music by Wilbur Hatch. And was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.